Hi, this is Jay Shield, director of Cursed Films. This is Marjorie DeHay, writer-director of the film Bottle Monster. Hello, this is Paul Overacker, producer of the film Bottle Monster. This is Alex Magania, uh, director of Smiling Woman. Hi, I'm Aria Jackson, and I'm the writer-director of the award-winning horror short Phone Home. Hey, it's me, Rad Chad from Scare Package. I play Jeremy King in real life. Hi, this is Zoe Graham. I'm Jesse from Scare Package. Hey, it's David Weiner, the director of In Search of Darkness and In Search of Darkness Part 2. And you're listening to The Graveyard Show. It's going to be awesome. Welcome. To the graveyard. And welcome to the Graveyard Show podcast, the best of 2020 and other stuff. I am your caretaker and the graveyard is open. Well, I never thought I'd be putting the word best with 2020 in a sentence. That's for sure. But uh, I'm going to try to do my best. Ah, see what I did there with this show. So the best of 2020 uh, I will be uh, looking back at highlights from my uh, new interviews from GYS Tombstones 17 through 22. And you heard all of those guests at the top of the show. Uh, as far as the other stuff in the title of the show, well, that's going to be some additional material that I have not included in any of these new graveyard show tombstones that I have been publishing this year. Um, I found some really cool stuff from, uh, well, back in the day, version one of the Graveyard Show podcast. Uh, I found some stuff from the uh, short-lived uh, horror podcasting network. I found a couple of promos for that that I'll play for you, and I'll get into what the uh, HPN was uh, a little later. I also have some outtakes from yours truly, and uh, I also have a few Graveyard Show flashbacks. flashbacks. Oh, wait. Uh, I forgot when I say flashback. 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 Anyway, uh, when I say that word, it means that uh, I'll be playing back some snippets um, from some of the original Graveyard Show podcasts. So we'll have a little bit of the old and a little bit of the new to round out the year. Now, speaking of rounding out the year, my next and final podcast of 2020 uh, will be the re-airing of Graveyard Show podcast number one, and that's from January 1st, 2009, and is with my interview with the co-writer and director of Midnight Movie, Jack Messett. Uh, The podcast will be uh, played uncut and in its entirety, and uh, it's as if you would have heard it um, when uh, it was first uploaded back in 2009. By the way, Midnight Movie, the killer cut, is streaming right now on Amazon Prime. So you can see the film uh, before listening to the podcast if you have not seen the movie before. If you'd like to get in contact with this show, the email address is gyspodcast at gmail.com. gyspodcast at gmail.com. You can send me your thoughts, comments, and also if you're a part of the horror community and you have something to promote, please don't hesitate to reach out as well. So 2020 began for the program as it ended in 2019. Uh, I was looking back at old interviews from 2009 through 2010. And um, the first show wasn't actually uploaded until March of 2020. And during the time of the pandemic and while I was uploading these shows, I was just thinking about getting back into the interview game. So I quietly put out some interview requests and uh, I got back a bunch of yeses, which was a, a really great sign. So when August came rolling around and you listened to Graveyard Show Tombstone 17, this is how I intro the show. And welcome to another edition of the Graveyard Show podcast. I am your caretaker and the graveyard is open. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> now, for those of you that are just listening to the show for the first time, you're probably like, huh, what? What is this all about? Um, but for those of you that have been following the show and listening to the show since I relaunched it last year, um, you will notice that this is actually going to be the very first original, updated, and current interview I've done since relaunching the podcast back in 2019. Yep, that's correct. Uh, my first interview in uh, 10 years. And ironically enough, when I was thinking about doing interviews again, 
uh, Jay was actually the person that I thought of as being my first guest, and it actually just worked out that way. And I told Jay that he got a kick out of it. So, yes, Jay Cheel uh, is the director of the um, Shutter series and AMC, I guess you could say now, uh, series, Cursed Films. And not only was Jay the director of the series, he was also the editor of the series. And I asked him if there was an advantage of being in both roles. Well, I mean, it's it's certainly something that isn't always recommended. I, I think usually people, the, the, the feeling is that you should kind of have another creative voice in the mix to uh, help you separate yourself from the material. And that that makes sense. Um, with, with these projects, I think with documentary in particular, it's just such an intimate form uh, that, that I've always just felt like, you know, editing is, is really an extension of the writing process when it comes to documentary filmmaking and and I would never say that by cutting my own work I'm I, I you know I couldn't find someone some collaborator that could probably do uh, uh, you know if not a much better job than me then at least work as a, a great partner in trying to find some common voice in a, a film I, I do feel that it's helpful when I'm in the field and I'm, I'm ultimately thinking about things from both the perspective of a, a director and an editor and being able to be, uh, you know, very sort of uh, aware of what we need and what we don't need. And, and when I do end up getting into the cutting room, that, that also pays off because it's, it's a lot of the, the show is sort of predetermined in a way, even though there's a lot of discovery that that's you know that takes place in the the editing process um the one big downside is when you're having creative conversations if you're you know as you do you know talking about notes or something you're by cutting your own show you're you're kind of distilling two potential voices down to one so uh you know I'm, i'm always having to speak on behalf of the director and editor and um that's that's a challenge but i i'm also just i love editing you know it that's that's a big part of it too just i love doing it so so you know there there are definitely cases to be made against it but i i guess sometimes i pursue it against my better judgment <laughs> i was gonna say you probably you know you're talking to yourself but it's it's done professionally <laughs> you're having battles between the, yeah. yourself as the director and yourself as the editor <laughs> yeah yeah and I, I mean i i'd like to think i'm 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 kind of um, humble enough or open enough to consider like I love notes, you know, like notes that are I, I don't like bad notes, <laughs> but and that's where it gets subjective. Like, what is a bad note? But anything that challenges a decision I've made in a way that makes me have to articulate a choice and by our, by being able to articulate it, then it gives me confidence about that choice and makes me feel better about it. But if I can't explain why I made a certain decision, then ultimately you have to think about that and, you know, try to figure out why that isn't working. And it it might be a matter of removing that decision altogether, or it might be something that comes, you know, 10 minutes before that moment that ultimately is not allowing it to land. So it's it's a fun exercise. Yeah. And I'm sure, too, again, I mean, with your editing background as you're directing, like you had mentioned, you know, you start, I'm sure as you were doing these interviews, you, the wheels are turning in your head while you're listening to them. And I'm sure you're probably coming up with visuals in your in your head as you're hearing these stories. And, mm-hmm. I'm, and I'm sure, too, for you, it was, it's, it's, it was much easier going, oh, well, I can cut to this. I can use this here. I need coverage of this. We need to worry about that. As opposed to you having that idea as 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 the director and then going to an editor and then having to explain all of it i'm sure it's there's a much easier shorthand for yourself as well putting this together and and probably maybe even faster for you to edit these and get these episodes done quicker than if it were two of you yeah for sure and you know we shoot with a very lean crew and we 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 get a lot of material when we're out there but it's very strategic so and when you ha- you only have certain amounts of time with some of these subjects sure. and you know to to be able to really zero in on what what i feel that i need uh, i think it's just that much more 
helpful to be thinking of it from that, that sort of editor's perspective. When talking about films that were cursed, one of the movies always mentioned is The Exorcist. And in that episode of Cursed Films, Linda Blair was asked about having bodyguards, and she didn't want to discuss it. I asked Jay more about that. Part of it was was this idea that, you know, she emerged from this film as this sort of representation of the devil. Um, and there were just concerns about her safety. And I, I think also just being a younger a younger star is probably an el- there's probably an element of that as well. But the studio the studio studio brought those guards on and I mean you see an interview in the actual show where there's reporters talking to her and asking her if she's been psychologically damaged by having taken part in this film. So this it was like just such a I guess it's a um, it's because of how successful the film was in in demonstrating this this sort of reality um, that William Friedkin uh, created of this little girl, you know, going through this unusual experience, and it it just shook people so much that the distinction between the film and and what's real, I guess, became a little bit blurred. Um, so you know, it, it, like like anything, it, it, there will be some some unhinged people that I think come out of the woodworks and start to um, make threats, even if they're they're not to be taken totally seriously. Especially with a film dealing with the devil, yeah. you know, it, with all of the religious undertones. The Omen is another film that always comes up when talking about films that are cursed, although executive producer Mace Newfeld and director Richard Donner had a different take on that. Their their sort of perspective was more of a, you know, it was blessed for us because it made a lot of money, it was a huge success, it actually saved the studio um, because Fox was having troubles at the time. and. Everyone always talks about the Omen coming out and actually saving Fox in order for Star Wars to eventually be made. Um, so, you know, it was very much a, a blessed production for them in terms of their careers. But that was actually something that in the edit, I, I sort of uh, realized that when I would talk to people about that film, they always just kept mentioning how, you know, all of these these weird situations leading up to and throughout the production of the movie were often situations where cast and crew were, were missing uh, disasters, Mm -hmm. you know, like they were not getting on the planes that were crashing or not being at the restaurants that were being bombed. And so it, it gave this perspective of, you know, that they were blessed because it seemed like the devil was, was ultimately uh, targeting other people or, 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 you know, influencing them to leave certain situations in which they might be in danger. So it just felt like a really nice twist on the whole curse idea yes. uh, for that particular episode and kind of an ironic one um, that, that was teed up by Richard Donner and Mace Newfeld for sure. Would you wear a jacket that Hitler owned? Would you try on a pair of glasses that were worn by cult leader Jim Jones? How about playing a guitar owned by Charles Manson? What is it that makes us repel from such objects? We all engage in this, in, you know, forms of magical thinking throughout our lives, you know, whether it's holding on to a a family heirloom or like a a sweater of a past loved one Mm -hmm. or, you know, the Hitler's jacket example that I think that's a very uh, you know Ted Bundy's sweater <laughs> like mm-hmm. there, I think there are a lot of people who just would not want to wear Ted Bundy's sweater <laughs> uh, there's actually a scene that was that was deleted from from uh, the show but Matt Gorley who's one of the, the people I interviewed he has a guitar that he bought and he actually discovered that it was previously owned by David Koresh the Waco cult leader and um, you know just the feeling that weird feeling of that being David Koresh's guitar creates this weird vibe Um, and you know that's coming from someone who is not uh, a believer in, in the supernatural 
In Search of Darkness, a journey into iconic 80s horror was another documentary streaming on Shudder. Director David Weiner joined me to discuss his film. He has quite an extensive resume, ranging from working on set as an assistant director to being the executive editor of Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. I asked him how he was able to reinvent himself so successfully. Tenacity, uh, drive, failure, um, ambition, um, confusion. Uh, you know, there, there, there's lots of dreams when you come out to Los Angeles to work in the film industry. And when I was a kid, that's that I, I knew early on that I wanted to work in movies and I wanted to make movies. Um, and using that as sort of my, my impetus, after I went to Ithaca College and I went to film school, I came out to Los Angeles. And my, my first dream was to work on movie sets. I wanted to be some important person who, who was clutching a walkie-talkie, running around, you know, being, being part of the, the entire team that makes movies. And uh, that was my goal. And, and I achieved that dream, and I worked on it for a little over four years on movies, TV, commercials, music videos, in a variety of roles, but I decided I kind of wanted to be an assistant director. But uh, at times like that, when you, could, you just sort of took what you could get because you wouldn't always get those jobs, I realized that you kind of need a plan B even in production. And I, and I kind of realized also that no one was going to hand me a directing job on a silver platter. you got to sort of create your own opportunity. So for me, I needed to, I figured writing is, the, is sort of the way to do it. And if I'm going to be a screenwriter, I need to know not only how to write, uh, even though I took some screenwriting classes in, in college and creative writing and so on and so forth, but I needed to understand the, the process of how this stuff goes through the system, you know, the sausage factory and development. So it, it can be a very long circuitous path in terms of the way I tell this story, but the nutshell is I kind of realized after about four years I didn't want to run around the set standing for 15 to 18 hours a day uh, for the rest of my life, and, and I wasn't going to get an opportunity to make movies myself if I didn't start writing movies or writing you know, working in development and figuring out the process. So that was sort of the beginning of my journey of getting off the set and figuring out how to best create opportunities for myself. In Search of Darkness was David's directorial debut, and I asked him how he ended up getting hired as the film's director. I, you know, I would just sort of observe the, the, the type of things that were going on in this advisor uh, group, and I started realizing certain things about how they were going about it, where I, I said, listen, I'm not going to tell you how to do your job, but I see this, and I see this, and I see this, and I would recommend you do this instead, and you do that instead, and this is probably a better way to do it in terms of you know, chasing after talent and structuring the movie and that kind of stuff like that. And because I had offered up, I said, listen, I'm happy to write questions, I'm happy to do interviews if you need me, and if you want me to, that would be fun for me and I'd be happy to be involved in the project. Uh, that's when Robin kind of took a, a leap of faith and, and offered me this, this because he didn't have a director, and I, I never said I'd like to direct this movie. Um, but I kind of said, you know, you need someone to steer this vision beginning to end. You know, you, you can't just edit it in the, in the editing, you know, bay without uh, some real serious guidance. And, and Robin... Robin had a very clear vision, don't get me wrong, but I think as a producer, you really need a director to see a project through from start to finish, and uh, I think he recognized that that was obviously the next step. Since the documentary was a crowdfunded project, David talked about making it into a long film versus making it into a series. This is a movie where anytime you make a, a crowdfunded project, you want to A, complete it, be satisfy the people who funded it and 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 I'm, I'm already losing my a b's and c's and the next thing <laughs> the next thing next thing, and next thing on the list is you know you just hope the best and you hope people will be receptive but if you're going to build a movie that's four and a half hours uh you're already got the cards are stacked against you you know how many people yeah. really want to sit you know i can't if i had a dime for everyone who said this should have been a series but we're a small company funding a small project that kind of grew very big. Hey, David, it should have been a series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, yeah, well, I, I totally I, get it. I, you know. I am not in disagreement. I am not in disagreement. I, I like that David had a really good sense of humor about that. Uh, due to the uh, size and depth of the documentary, I asked David how much homework he needed to do researching for the film. I actually did quite a bit of homework. Um because a lot of this is, is recontextualization of the stuff that I knew already or that I dismissed already or that I just had never gotten around to and it just seemed bits and pieces or that I heard of or I was discovering for the first time because there's so much material out there. But I, I was a pretty well versed. I was, I, 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 I'm a genre fan through and through. Sci-fi, horror, fantasy, action, you know, if it's a hybrid of all that stuff. But this was an opportunity to kind of revisit certain franchises that I kind of, at a certain point, you know, when you're a teen and you become a little cynical and you're like, yeah, well, I like the first one, but now they're just sequeling it and it's just about the kills. And, you know, it's, I, I, I kind of have a certain, they certain have a certain charm to them when you look back at them now where you can recognize not the transparency of the, of the producer's attempt to get money, but you could see the creativity that was involved, whether or not you recognized it in the first place. And that's the kind of thing that we're sort of exploring and revisiting and recontextualizing. Around five minutes into the film, David focuses on the pop culture and politics of the 1980s. And I asked him if he felt that would create a good foundation for the film. I think it's important to frame the era contextually. Uh, I didn't want to dive too much into either pop culture or politics because that's a whole movie in itself. But I think um, I think there, you know, I, I sort of wrestled with, you know, do people think the psychology of horror and do people think the pop culture and the the politics of the era, um, you know, how much do they need to know? And and I think the toughest element of putting a film like this together is you want to present. Uh, kind of a case study and so you need all the pieces and so while some might be a little more obvious uh, I think if you don't include it there are going to be parts of the audience where this is all brand new to them and it, it doesn't quite gel co you know coherently if you're missing certain pieces assuming people already know that so while it might be a bit didactic at parts I think overall it's absolutely necessary to kind of create some some era context for why the horror, you know, first of all, why do people love watching horror? Second of all, you know, what was the 80s about? Was it just Rubik's Cubes and MTV or what was there more to it? And and by the way, a lot of people don't talk about MTV the way they used to back then. And so they not they might not realize that that was a huge influence, as you mentioned earlier just on, on movies and pop culture and entertainment, and it had an absolute ripple effect across all, all platforms of media. So you gotta sort of create that, that foundation and then dive into the movies. So when you, when you talk about movies reflecting the era, whether overtly or more subtly or in terms of perception, you need to understand why. Some of the greatest and most memorable practical special effects were from films released in 1981, Scanners, The Burning, American Werewolf in London, and The Howling. And I asked David about the importance of that year. That year is very much uh, set the tone for the rest of the decade because you have to remember that uh, filmmakers as audience members you know, sat in the theater and they watched Joe Dante's The Howling or John Landis's The American Werewolf in London. And they just thought to the, or Friday the 13th, Sean S. Cunningham, you know, and Tom Savini's work. You, you just, they, they just said to themselves, oh my God, you can do that? I can build a story around that. I can make a movie around that just to have that or a variation of that. And that really sort of affected the trajectory of the creativity uh, and, and the amount of, the volume of movies that were made in, in, in the years to follow based on the influence of, of just those early two years. I briefly touched on the term final girl and how some actresses were fine with the term and others weren't. You know, when someone like Heather Langenkamp pushes back and says, you know, I'm an equal, I'm looking for equal opportunity ass kicking, you know, and I, I look mm -hmm. forward to a day where it's not about gender, it's just about the character. Yeah. Uh, it's important to share that perspective. 
I liked uh, Kelly Moroni's uh, description. She said, was it about Final Girl? She said, back in my day, we used to call that the star, <laughs> which is true. Right. It's like, yeah, you, you can't argue there. <laughs> One of the things we always return to when talking about 1980s culture was the video store experience, most notably the mom and pop shops. I wondered why we always find ourselves reminiscing about that. Yeah, it, you know, I, I think the thing about the, the the video store experience that we all reminisce about now is really kind of amusing to me because, you know, back then it was just a, it was just the necessity. You went out, you and you 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 browse the movies and you pick something or a couple things, you know, if you wanted to stack up a, a pile for the week or the weekend. But it was just sort of the way you did things because that, that was the only sort of outlet to do it other than cable or just snapping the TV channels to see what was on. Yeah. Um, but we look back at it now incredibly fondly for a very obvious reason now. <laughs> we don't have video stores anymore. I mean, there there there's still are some around, but it's not as pervasive as it used to be. And uh, I think the tactile element of picking up the box, looking at the front and the back, physically thinking about it while it's, while it's physically in your hand, there's there's a certain appeal to that whole process of, of anticipation and hoping that something's going to be good and also committing even if the movie isn't that good because you rented it and that's all you've got. Whereas today, you know, you could just change the channel and streaming and flipping through all the, you know, the titles, arguably it's the same thing, but there, it's just a different feeling and it's a different process. And I think... Uh, you know, we all get nostalgic for, you know, Blockbuster and, and, and the mom and pop stores. But the reality that I think a lot of people sort of gloss over now is that Blockbuster was kind of the evil corporate entity that wanted to uh, censor a lot of films for a more family friendly uh, uh, perception of themselves. And so if you really wanted the, the down and dirty stuff, you had to go to the mom and pop places to get it or you had to go to three zigzag across town mom and pop places until you got the one that you wanted. Another focus of the documentary was the art form known as movie posters and how much they set the mood of the film before you even stepped into the theater. Heather Langenkamp of Nightmare on Elm Street kind of laments that fact. You know, she talks about how how spectacular all of the Nightmare on Elm Street art was with the same artist consistently doing all the posters. And then you look at these things with the 90s where it's just the actor's face and, and a, a logo with a font. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I know. It's... And you have no idea. And, and like, you know, I'm just, I'm just the same way with, like, the, the James Bond posters, you know? Like, as they became more and more just about Daniel Craig's face. Yeah. You know, or or, uh, or Pierce Brosnan's face. I was just like, come on, where's the spectacular explosions, artwork, and really good, really evocative stuff that made you want to dive into the adventure on the poster itself, with anticipation. Now I'm going to pause here because this wasn't the first time movie posters were discussed on this program. On Graveyard Show podcast number 34 from August of 2009, I had writer, director, and blogger Stacy Ponder on the program, and we discussed how she would always find these cool old movie posters, and she would post them on her website, Final Girl. I'll let her take it from here as I present this graveyard show flashback. 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 One of my favorite pieces on your website is um, Awesome Movie Poster Fridays. <laughs> yeah, people really like that. Where do you find them? Which kind of surprises me. I just spend a lot of time on the internet looking for them. I spend a lot of time on the internet. Looking you do a hell of a job because job. I got to tell you, I mean, there, there are some great posters that you find. Yeah, I try to just, you know, I, I pick a theme each week. Um, a subject matter like Evil Dead movie posters, and then I just try to find every Evil Dead poster I can possibly find in every language from every country, every variation you've heard, wow. uh, you've ever seen. It's uh, I never expected people to respond to that as well as they have, but people really like it. So, cool. and I like I like it because it's about yes, I did one or two editions about crappy movie posters. <laughs> But what were are, some of what were some of your crappy movie posters? Well, the crappy movie poster <laughs> phase, I think. I mean, most movie posters are crappy nowadays. Yeah. Um, because they're just Photoshop messes. They're just getting away from these beautiful pieces of art that were very evocative and very much tried to set the mood before you even stepped into the theater. Um, now it's just photoshopped crap that doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't even make sense. You know, oh, she's got a mouth instead of an eyeball. Yeah. 
you know, and I think it all, most of it started with Scream, um, which is when the people who were in the horror movie kind uh-huh. of became more important than the movie itself. Like they were hiring yeah. well-known actors to do it. And so the poster became headshots of all these well-known actors and that was it. Like Scream should have had a kick-ass poster. And I think Scream is a great film and the poster really should have yeah, you tried know, to capture that and it doesn't. Yeah, I, I never thought about that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it should have had either the killer on there or so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, something something instead it was like here's nev campbell and yeah. david arquette yay <laughs> and from there it just kind of like everybody started doing that so it's you know final destination and urban legend and i know what you did last summer and all these movies are just like pictures of people who were on the wb yeah. at the time <laughs> and that's it and yeah it's not really exciting no it's not it really isn't i mean you um yeah gosh i miss the old days of of, of art of art yeah. you know uh, uh, drawing and even even just cartoons and stuff. It's, it's it is a lost art, that's for sure. Yeah. And computers aren't helping matters much because it is. It's real easy. It's just like okay, drag a couple of images together. There you go, done. Yeah, and no one really cares, and it, it's just they're not lasting sort of works of art anymore. I think one of the only recent films that's really tried to do that is The Strangers. Mm. Had a great poster mm-hmm. that was very retro. Yeah. Um, and all of that, but otherwise, it's just. You know, it's you interesting know? because you think about like a lot of the movies of the 70s and 80s that are being remade, you would think that some of that would have come back as well, you would think. Because, I mean, you see it with, um, well, certainly with Grindhouse. I mean, they did a great job of, of yeah. trying to make those retro. And, yeah. and, of course, with the filmmakers, obviously, you know, they're very big in the, in, into that time period, so they have a lot of influence on that. But I'm really surprised that, you know, they, the studios wouldn't try to maybe capitalize on that. Yeah. Well, even when they re-release these films on DVD, they're changing the covers. Yeah, I know. You know, like um, Scarecrows and The Burning and some of these movies that have just been re-released after 25 years. Instead of using the original art, which was fantastic, they're using the crappy Photoshop stuff. Yeah. And it just looks lousy. Yeah, it reminds me... uh, I'm sorry. It just... Oh, no, It reminds me of the Creatures of the Night album, the Kiss album, when they re-released it with the band without their makeup and it's like yeah uh, what what i i that what and then and they finally you know released it as it was and it's just like my god why uh, yeah, yeah i don't know why that decision yeah it, it, it doesn't make sense it just doesn't that's what i don't understand i mean i realize that you know the suits aren't necessarily horror fans and all of that but there's got to be somewhere along the line there's got to be somebody who gets it and it's going to kind of know what people have been hungering to see rather than just the same old stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, what was it? Um, <clears throat> which film is uh, Night of the Creeps is, uh, is being you know, released now on DVD yeah. finally? And I cannot remember which website it was. I, it's, it's one of the major, you know, one of the major horror websites, um, I'm pretty sure. But... They're, I guess the, the, the company's doing a, um, which, which of these Night of the Creeps, you know, DVD covers do you like and vote on it? And uh, the website was like, these all suck because these aren't any of the <laughs> yeah. original, you know, posters. Yeah. And why are they doing new, you know, new, new, uh, new cover for this? And it's just terrible. And I was like, you know what? You're right. <laughs> yeah. I just don't get it. I don't get it. Yeah. If it's worth re-releasing, then it might be worth using the image that all the people who saw it the first time are going to remember, you know, and just, I understand they want to capture a new audience and all of that, but, you know, it worked the first time. Why isn't it working the second time? Yeah. Flashback. 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 I hope you enjoyed that. Stacy was always one of my favorite guests to have on the show. Now let's get back to 2020. Scare Package was another film featured on Shudder, and two of the actors from that film, Jeremy King and Zoe Graham, joined me on the program to discuss the film. Jeremy King plays Chad of Rad Chad's Horror Emporium, the video store where the frame story takes place. Uh, The frame story and the final story of the film were written and directed by Aaron Koontz, who was also the co-creator of the film's concept. I asked Jeremy if it helped working with Aaron, uh, who was so close to the material. Here's what he had to say. 
A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And the thing I absolutely love about working with Aaron is, is he really lets you just get in there and play. Um, you know, we would do some takes that were pretty close to the script. Uh, I would joke around every day I came in. I'm like, there's a script for this. Like, why did you guys not tell me about that? Ahead of time? <laughs> um, but if we had time, he would kind of let us do our, do our own thing. And, you know, stay close to the story and all that stuff, but really just let us kind of have fun and explore the characters. And especially in like the wraparound segments with, um, with Byron and with Han, those guys, man, just made me laugh so hard throughout the whole thing. Like I, I, I literally had a hard time keeping a straight face while I was on camera with them. And then some of the scenes I watched just between the two of them, like I would stay on set and watch their stuff. And we almost ruined a few of their takes because we were laughing so hard behind the camera. So the, the whole time it was just such a fun atmosphere, you know, and especially uh, the final segment, Horror hypo uh, Hypothesis, getting to work with a legend like Joe Bob Briggs and then also Dustin Rhodes, who's who's a wrestler gold dust. So yeah. the whole thing was just a huge, huge treat, you know. Jeremy also discussed the importance of Aaron's horror knowledge and support when it came to Jeremy's performance. I think working uh, with Aaron in general, just having the level of uh, friendship I had with him and having that level of camaraderie makes things nice too, because I know that at the end of the day, he's going to let me, if I go a little off the rails, he's going to let it go. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But we're going to have that, we have that sort of camaraderie where we know he knows I'm going to take things a little too far sometimes and they'll have to bring me back. And I know I have the ability because on a lot of films, it's such a tight shoot window and it's such a tight schedule um, that you don't, I mean, it's, it's, here's the script, you know, say your lines, make it your own. Um, but then we're moving on. Yeah. And with that, it was so nice to be able to, you know, take things off the rails sometimes. And a lot of that did make it into the, into the, you know, final cut. And, and like I said, he's such a, he's such a huge knowledge base about everything horror that if I said anything that was even remotely incorrect in referencing, you know, a sequel or a trilogy or, or anything, he would say, well, no, no, actually this, you know, this killer was a, you know, uh, a slasher. He wasn't mm -hmm. a, you know, this, I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. So yeah, it was, it was such a fun process. I asked Jeremy about improv scenes and he talked about how Aaron would let him go while still making sure he was accurate with horror history. For me, doing comedy is such a joy that I just kind of drop into it and whatever happens, happens. And I'm sure there was, <laughs> I'm sure there was times that we got a little too ridiculous and Aaron would kind of come in and be like, all right, uh, that, you know, that was really funny, but, um, you know, let's try to stick a little more to the script sure. <laughs> or, um, or, or when you're improv you know, you throw something out there and Aaron has such a absolute grasp on all the minute details of every single horror movie that's ever been out there that I would throw something out there about Halloween or Friday the 13th or, you know, like, I don't even remember what it was, but he, he literally came up to me after a take and he's like, uh, actually in, in Friday the 13th part two, that didn't happen. That happened, uh, you know, later on. Um, oh, wow. and this, this is actually what happened, <laughs> oh, my but I mean, that kind of detail. I mean, and if you look at, if you, if you like break the film down, there's so many Easter eggs that he put in there just from his vast knowledge of different stuff. Of course, I had to ask Jeremy about working with Joe Bob Briggs in the final story of the film Horror Hypothesis. And he shared how Joe Bob came up with some of the ideas on set. He had gone and talked to Aaron, like even in the walking scene that we did, that he was mm -hmm. calling me Brad and, and like throwing all this stuff out there. He had gone to Aaron and talked about all this stuff, but I didn't know any of it. So, oh, <laughs> so like, that's great. Yeah, it's going on. He's like, oh, all right, Brad. You know, <laughs> and I'm just trying to. And then during the death scene, I. I I think he changed up a few times what he said when I finally knelt down. Um, so it was, it was like one of those things, like you're trying to stay in character, you're trying to stay in the moment, you know, like I was supposed to be all upset, but like, you know, 
right when they right when they call cut, you like break up laughing, and then you gather yourself together for the next scene. You know? Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. There was. Um, I'm trying to find the quote that he said to you. Uh, oh, here it is. Uh, at one point, he says, "You're like the personification of what the internet." <laughs> <laughs> to film criticism and i'm like yeah that sounds like joe bob <laughs> oh yeah yeah that was that that was definitely coming directly from joe bob yeah he i think he had talked to aaron about that beforehand he's like i'd really like to throw this in there jeremy also had great things to say about the crew as well it's it's just such a cool feeling to know that that um aaron and cameron and those guys were able to pull that off and you know something like this like we had a blast filming it but it also comes down to great editing. It comes down to sound, everything. There's so many little things that go into it that they that they really did an amazing job on. And and you know we get a lot of credit as actors, um, but even when you do your best in some projects, if it's not edited well or it's not, you know, it it, it definitely doesn't come out as good as this did. So it's 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 been a it's been a pure joy from working on it. To being able to experience it with with some of the groups that we have too yeah you don't hear that too much uh he's a really good guy and i know the crew would appreciate hearing him say that jeremy shared what it was like when he saw the finished film with an audience just the whole thing has been such a cool experience i didn't i had ne- i hadn't seen any of the wraparound or any of the other short films when we were filming this so they took about two years to do all the different shorts and then we basically created the wraparound in the in the final segment afterwards. And Aaron had had described some of the different uh, shorts to me as we were going, because you know they'll cut in into them and out of them um, from the video store. So he he was kind of describing to me what they were like. But man, I tell you, when we when I finally got to see it with an audience, it was such a special experience. Like the first time I saw it with an audience was in Sitges in Spain which is one of the biggest horror festivals in the world. And then the second time was in Telluride um, at the at the horror show over there. And just the audiences were so great. And it, it's one of those things that, like, I've seen movies to where it just puts a smile on your face. And you walk around for, like, a week just, like, laughing about the different stupid little things that you saw. Like, it reminds me of when I saw Super Troopers when I was, you know, like 10 years ago or however long that came out mm-hmm. like that that moved a smile on my face for a week and seeing this and such a like such the other directors did such a great job with their segments that i mean i was just so happy about it i you know the first time i saw it i was just ecstatic now actress zoe graham joined me on the program to talk about her role as jesse in horror hypothesis the final story in scare package and <laughs> she completely caught me off guard right at the start Joining me now is Zoe Graham, who plays Jesse in the segment Horror Hypothesis. Zoe's previous acting credits include Support the Girls, Secret in Their Eyes, and Boyhood, to name a few. She's also quite a talented and accomplished artist as well, and it is my pleasure welcoming Zoe inside the graveyard. Zoe, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. What a nice intro. Well, thank you. (laughs) I appreciate it. Um, I think that was the very first time that's ever happened to me uh, on the program off an intro like that. So once I got my bearings, um, I did ask Zoe about her audition for the role of Jesse. Uh, I auditioned for him in Austin, which is where I'm, I am as well. And uh, first of all, he was so wonderful to work with in an audition. There are some people, some directors in auditions that like they they don't give you any feedback mm-hmm. in the room they'll just be like how about try it more this way and you kind of were like guessing and yeah. he was so personable and so kind it was it was a group audition like they we were he was doing um uh you know one virgin one jock one uh any of the other characters that the stoner uh-huh. uh he was auditioning in groups of those so getting to see the way that he would work with different actors in that audition and like laugh when something was funny you know like he he just like would respond in such a human way i was already very game to to work with him as soon as i auditioned with him and then secondarily in the audition i asked i'd gotten a chance to read through um that segment so the script for horror hypothesis and i was like how are you gonna do all this stuff in here i don't want to give away what the the things are but there's a couple of um 
very uh, gory, incredible things that happen. And he was like, oh, we're doing it all practical effects. And I was like, I... I have to see this. I have to be there. <laughs> I have to be part of this. I was so excited. I'm like a huge practical effects fan, not necessarily just in horror, but like across the board, I just think it's such a cool way to work and a really cool way to like get people more involved in the story. Um, and that delivered tenfold more than I could ever imagine. The, the last scene of uh, the whole movie, I didn't know that was going to happen when I signed on for the movie. And it was quite a finish to the experience. I also asked Zoe about working with Aaron Koontz, and she had the same appreciation for Aaron as Jeremy did. It was amazing. I mean, the, the attitude that Aaron presented in the audition ran through the entire filming process that was just like, we're here to make a thing together. Things are going to evolve as we shoot. And and he just seems so collaborative, or he, he is so collaborative. Um, and, you know, at, at one point, there was supposed to, we were supposed to end with Jesse sort of doing a classic horror scream. And as we had shot, Jesse had just sort of become like more and more practical, like more and more the straight man of the segment and, you know, not putting up with any of it. Yeah. And and by the end, he was like, you know, I don't know if we need this. Like, I don't know if this is right. And I was like, I, I actually agree. But, but the fact that he was willing to change his ending that he wrote so... You know, it was the right decision, I think. Mm -hmm. And and the fact that he was willing to change it and be so flexible with his own work, that's like, to me, uh, such a, yeah, it's a special writer-director who's able to do that. Zoe also had this to say about working with Jeremy King. It was funny to be on the set with people who were so comedically quick. Um, I, I've, you know, just haven't had that much experience in like improv comedy and, and that kind of acting. So then getting to be around, especially Jeremy, who, you know, if Aaron says, okay, say a couple things, he can go on for 20 minutes. Like he doesn't, <laughs> he'll never stop. Um, it, it was very funny to be around people. I mean, everyone brings their own energy to a set, but Jeremy is, <laughs> will yeah. like, he'll keep, he'll keep, he'll say, you know, he'll, at the end of a scene, he'll improv in three different ways in quick succession. And each one is like, you're whipping your head back and forth being like, I never expected that. I never expected that. <laughs> and it's, it's like sometimes hard to keep up, but he's very funny and very talented. Um, you know what? Let's revisit Jeremy King um, since he had this to say about Zoe. But speaking of Zoe Graham, there was a scene where uh, when Joe Bob is, is, is dying and I decide that I'm going to go after the devil's like impaler and there's there's this one moment where she grabs my shoulder and i you know, like i touch her hand and i say no oh, this is my destiny and we it took us about eight or ten takes to get through that just because i don't know what it was but it was like the look that we were <laughs> 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 like neither of us could keep a straight face through any of that like, it was so yeah. ridiculous oh that's cool i'm sure at a certain point aaron's like okay come on let's move on here what yeah. are you doing <laughs> One of my favorite scenes in Scare Package was in Horror Hypothesis, and it was with Zoe's character of Jesse and the character of the jock. Uh, the scene tricks you into thinking one thing is happening, uh, but it's actually something else. The camera pulls into the room and they think I'm making sex noises with the other character who's the jock, but then it turns out that he's like bandaging a wound kind of tightly on my leg. Yep. And the place that where the wound was on my leg, they were like, we're not really sure how to shoot this. like." how can we make this look like sex Sure, <laughs> from yeah. the, like silhouette? Cause it just didn't, it didn't totally make sense. And then, you know, I was kind of listening to this conversation and all of these people talking about like how we were going to be positioned. And I remember like poking my head into the conversation and being like, well, how about, how about oral sex? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and <laughs> them being like, we never thought of that. Like we gotta, that's perfect. I felt like uh, such a, a mad scientist of that comedic moment to be able to be like, you guys, we're missing something here. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to make sense unless it's yeah. like this. Um, so again, another moment where I was like, I never considered that I would be on a set being like, well, how about 
it's it's not uh, genital to genital. Yeah. <laughs> I never thought those words would be coming out of my mouth. <laughs> That's funny. But there we were. And well, again, the creative process, right? I mean, you you felt totally. like you could you could suggest that, and everyone was like, "Hey, wait a minute, never thought about that." Um, Again, and that's and that like goes to that's big props to Aaron who on many other sets I would not be comfortable saying that and yeah. wouldn't you know would be so worried about how that would come across or like how if they would be like why are you even having this conversation with us yeah. uh, and yeah. and they were so immediately game. Let's take a little break from 2024 a few. I came across some promos for the short-lived horror podcasting network, which the Graveyard Show was a part of in 2009, and I thought I'd invite my trusty werewolf here, Lawrence, to come over, and he will take you deep into the Graveyard Show archives, where you will hear both promos that I used to start and end my shows with back in 2009, and I included two of the shows. Uh, One where I announced that the Graveyard Show is joining the HPN, and then the other where the Graveyard Show was leaving the HPN. So, Lawrence, if you please. This program is a proud member of the Horror Podcasting Network. To find more horror shows like this one, please visit the HPN website at horrorcasts.blogspot.com That's horrorcasts.blogspot.com Now the other subject that I wanted to talk about is something that directly relates to the show. And it's what you heard at the very, very top of the show. It is the Horror Podcasting Network. And it's something that the Graveyard Show is, is proud to be a member of. Essentially, it is a community for those of us that create podcasts or uh, webcasts. It's something that uh, has been going on for a little while. It's something that I have been a part of for about, I guess now, a couple of weeks. And if you listened to my show last week, uh, you heard uh, me mention the Horror Podcasting Network. Uh, We are independent podcasting producers that are all under one one rooftop, I guess you could say. One horror rooftop. And we are promoting each other's shows. We are figuring out uh, the, the, I guess you'd call, I don't want to call them the bylaws, but we're just trying to figure out what it is that the Horror Podcasting Network really is going to become down the road. So we're kind of getting our constitution together, I guess you could say. And I want to tell you that uh, the individual who did the uh, top of the show that you hear or that you heard, uh, that was Julie over at uh, 19 Nocturne Boulevard. She has a uh, audio uh, drama anthology series that she does over there. So she's one of the members of the Horror Podcasting Network. Uh, she did a great job of doing the uh, bumper for the show. So, uh, Julia, I just wanted to say thank you very much for doing that. Uh, she did several for us, and uh, they're all great. And I uh, wanted to thank her uh, on the show. And the one that you're going to hear at the end of the show, oh, yes, there are going to be two going to bombard you with this is James Melzer who did the one that you're going to hear at the end of the show he is a uh, writer uh, out of uh, Canada and uh, I really enjoyed his as well so JJ thank you so much for doing that as well and it wasn't just for me these bumpers were for all the shows so what I'm getting at is from now on the graveyard show is going to have a new open and a new close the open is going to be what you heard it's going to be a bumper for the horror podcasting network and the, the end, I'm going to run some promos for some of the other shows that you can hear on the Horror Podcasting Network. And I also just want to thank everybody for, uh, for including me in the Horror Podcasting Network. I can tell you right now to everyone listening to the show, everyone who is included in the Horror Podcasting Network, even though we're all independent and we have our own shows, everyone is working for the greater good and... You know, these are really, really cool people, and they're very passionate about what they do, and they're working very hard to make sure that not just them, but all of us provide great content for all of you out there who take the time to listen to our shows, because we all know that you don't have the time to listen to every single show, or at least every single episode of every single show. So we all appreciate you listening to the shows and contributing to them. And once again... I just want to thank everybody over at the HPN 
for including me in this. It really does mean a lot to me, and I will do what I can to make sure that the Horror Podcasting Network is out there, just like I know everyone else will uh, in the HPN as well. As I mentioned uh, in the past, for the past, I guess, three months or so, uh, I've been uh, promoting the Horror Podcasting Network because the Graveyard Show uh, was a part of the Horror Podcasting Network. Notice how I said the word was. Uh, this week, I made the decision to uh, move on from the Horror Podcasting Network. And actually, uh, HPN has been down quite a bit this year, and I'm not really sure uh, what the future holds for it. Uh, but it was just one of those things where I felt like uh, the Graveyard Show needed to move on from it. Uh, it has nothing to do with any of the members. Everybody that I've met through the Horror Podcasting Network uh, has been fantastic. They're a good group of people. And, you know, the one thing about podcasting is this. You know, we're all doing it. Well, most of us are doing it on our, you know, on our spare time, during our free time. And there are some of us that are single, and there are some of us that are married, and others that have, you know, married with kids. So it's a fine line sometimes between podcasting, balancing real life, and also your, your, your jobs as well. So everybody that I've met through the Horror Podcasting Network, you know, they all put on really good shows. They work very hard to uh, entertain all of you out there. And it's just one of those things where I just felt like uh, for the Graveyard Show, it just needed you know, to move on from there. So I don't have uh, any grudges to hold against anyone at the Horror Podcasting Network. I wish all of them very, very uh, much success, whether it's in their own endeavors or as a whole. Uh, and um, you'll more than likely be hearing a lot of promos from those very shows that uh, are, um, are with the Horror Podcasting Network, whether they were with the Horror Podcasting Network or still are. So I mentioned it because... I know how some people are. They pick up every little nuance in a show. So when you hear the show enough, you hear, you know, Julie come out talking about, you know, horror podcasting network. And I just felt it was necessary to mention it because, uh, the, um, the HPN, um, promos will no longer obviously be, um, played on this show. So just so I don't get a bunch of emails from people saying what's going on. So, um, and there you have it. This podcast is a proud member of the Horror Podcasting Network. www.horrorcasts.blogspot.com Thank you, Lawrence. Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed listening to that. You know, those promos were so great, and uh, I really loved having those bookending the program. Uh, it's just too bad that the uh, Horror Podcasting Network was uh, short-lived, but, you know, these things are really tough to manage when you have uh, so many personalities involved. Now, I will say that it was fun being part of the HPN, and there were some HPN podcasters that became friends and guests of this program. Um, Rich Peterson from Bordello of Horror, uh, Julie Hoverson from 19 Nocturne Boulevard, and Brother D from Mail Order Zombie. All right, let's get back to the present. So having your film on Shutter wasn't a requirement to be on the podcast this year. Um, the Graveyard Show podcast is a proud supporter of independent horror. And uh, I was really happy to welcome the team behind the independent film Bottle Monster uh, to the program. That would be writer-director Marjorie DeHay and producer Paul Overacker. And I asked them about how much pre-production they did for their film. And here's what they had to say. You know, realistically, you try to do as much pre-production as possible. And we had this beautiful location. It was the historic Harris House, which is a, a beautiful Victorian house. And, you know, you tried to prepare for everything. But once you're on set, you realize a lot of different things. There were actually a lot of weird mirrors in the scenes that we had to kind of go around. So I feel sometimes as much as you prepare ahead of time, and again, we finished the script June 1st, we were shooting end of July. So we were, yeah. go, 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 get it done. So I think preparing ahead of time, you do as much as you can, but once you get to location, you have to be flexible. We had to rewrite scenes. We had to change things. We had wonderful crew, wonderful actors, just 
really amazing people who put a lot of time, energy, and effort into making the film and were flexible because we were working with kids too and that changes schedules. So, you know, we were really blessed to have a really good team. So, you know, in terms of preparation, we tried to do as much as we could other t- at the time, but you know, the reality of any filmmaking is once you get on set, everything kind of changes. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. Sorry. I, you, know, you mentioned the mirrors. There are mirrors all over this place, and not just flat mirrors, they were curved mirrors. So it doesn't matter where you're shooting, if any crew was in any particular angle, they would be seen. So, I mean, I, that was a nightmare shooting it. In uh, post production, I am surprised, absolutely surprised that we did not get any any reflections. Or there is one, one one particular angle. There was a boom shot in in the mirror, and I was able to you know digitally remove that. But it, for everything we've done in the film, it was just that one, and not even like boom shadows. It was just the boom was in a mirror. When shooting a movie, the crew really does become uh, a family, and Paul discussed the importance of that. Your crew becomes family. So knowing how people work is key to making a a production go well or dealing with people's, you know, I don't want to say we we didn't have really many issues on this thing, but, you know, if somebody's having a bad day, you know how to deal with it. Um, So, but, you know, as a producer, I could not, it it drove me mad that we couldn't go faster. You know, it's like it was a single (laughs) camera shoot that if we had two cameras, it was better. But it's like, yeah, you know, Marjorie took the lead, you know, it's like, and it, she knew the time crunch we were in on everything. So it's like she tweaked the script to the location of what we had and what we needed. So it was really a testament to Marjorie on this whole production. As an independent filmmaker, there are times when you have to make compromises, whether it's adjusting shots or cutting scenes. Uh, it's generally uh, about losing things, but not always. Uh, Marjorie discussed one of those rare times when compromise actually led to getting something back in return. We were cutting scenes, and luckily, because I had been the writer, I knew the script inside and out, and I was like, okay, we can cut this scene because it's not going to affect the outcome. And so that, I, I at least could have that flexibility where often if you take somebody else's script, you know, you have to consult with them, et cetera. So I'd be up rewriting till like 3 a.m., get back up at 7 to go on, on set. And we did cut a scene, which was one of my favorite scenes. And then I was like, we had a little more time one day. And I was like, no, I really want this scene. And it's, it's a beautiful scene between uh, Tammy Bird, who plays the police officer and the young boy. And it just turned out so wonderfully well. And she didn't want it cut. I didn't want it cut. And we made it happen. And it still is, I'm getting goosebumps right now thinking about it. It was just such a great scene. So, you know, luckily we were able to get most of the scenes that we really loved in the film. Ironically, Marjorie and I had uh, a common connection, which I wasn't aware of um, until uh, we were getting ready to do the interview. And it's Miss Misery herself, Raina Young, the queen of Bay Area horror. Uh, Raina had been on my program many times back in 2009 and 2010, and she had put together a horror anthology book called A Scream in the Night, which you can still purchase on Amazon, uh, among other places. And Marjorie had one of her stories included in that book, and I asked her about it. First of all, I want to say Raina is amazing as is Maureen Whalen, who got me involved in this project. So a lot of credit to them for pulling together these amazing women writers. And the book is now available on Amazon as of about a week ago. Um, My story is called The Hello Motel. And it's about a woman who is struggling with drug addiction and kind of reliving her life in her dying moment. So, and it is a very redemptive story, and but also very just how women struggle with, and I guess, you know, it, it's interesting that it's another story about addiction, but I think that people have these traumatic events that happen in their life that they never deal with. So this is, you know, this woman who's never dealt with her traumatic past. And then she has the ability to help somebody else in her kind of dying moment. So it's a interesting tale, kind of a a, a tale of what's actually. It's one of those what's going on, what's like momentum 
memento, you're like, what's going on? What's going on? And then at the end, you're like, oh, okay, now I get it. Independent filmmaking is not just limited to feature films. There are many indie filmmakers out there who create horror short films. One of those filmmakers who joined me on the show was Alex Magana, who directed the short films Smiling Woman, Outbreak, and Lost in the Woods, just to name a few. I asked Alex if the film classes he took in college helped him when he started making his films. Well, I think the biggest thing I took from the school I went to was because um, you kind of ended up working with like a group of friends, like each person, and those would be the people you worked in like major your films with and the group like my group of friends that we all collaborated with like slowly like one by one um, my other classmates kind of like ended up dropping out or like pursuing something else so we'd kind of like pick up the slack and like learn what they did so I had a friend that was like good with camera work like a lot better than me and like a lot someone else that did like lighting for like um, stages and like concerts and so he was like really good at lighting and so like as they dropped out just like learning all the different aspects so I like became more rounded than I think I would have if I just like focused on like one aspect so like for me I know how to do like pretty much you know like everything from the producing like casting to like the writing to the directing and then the camera set up the lighting editing special effects so I like know it all and I think a lot of it's because we didn't have you kind of like had to do it ourselves at the school I went to because it was like smaller and you know compared to like out here and a lot of the schools like in LA you're more like you know you just do cinematography or you just write you just direct I asked Alex what attracted him to the horror genre and here's what he had to say it's like I you know like with the horror community there's like such a strong like um, support for you know content and like artists and stuff and it was, it's like cool to see you know, posting in groups and people sharing it and, like, commenting on it and liking it um, versus, like, a lot of the other stuff I've done, like, outside of the genre that's, like, you know, kind of just falls on, like, deaf ears and it just doesn't really do much. And and I guess, like, I like um, the horror because it's so, like, stylized and you, you know, like, as a filmmaker, really, like, you get, like, a, a big impact, like, with the camera angles and the camera work and, like, the storytelling. Like, people really value the storytelling aspect versus like when I was doing music videos it's more about you know the song and the musician or like other stuff I've done it's kind of like more about the talent but like with horror you know the talent matters but it's also you know like the storytelling and the director and so it's it's cool and then also like the aspect of like some of the horror shorts I've done where it's just like kind of ridiculous like the do not open which is about a box and it's like to kind of make a box scary you know it's, it's cool to take these like things that nobody would really think of being afraid of and like trying to figure out a way to make it scary alex's film was a story about an alien takeover and there were sequences that were shot on mobile phones from different locations i asked alex how he coordinated that as the country and the world were beginning to go into covid lockdown so he actually did that film that short film, like, right at the beginning of the quarantine. So, like, right in, the, like, the first couple of weeks, we were, like... Wow. Perfect like, time. Trying to come up with something something to film. And, you know, like, everything was, like, you know, social distancing, like, stay at home. It was, like... I feel like that was, like, the hardest um, quarantine was, like, you know, the initial, like, month. Yeah. It was when everybody was, like, super staying away and, like, staying inside. And so we were, like, how can we create something and like also something relevant with like the time and then um we came up with the concept so that was kind of like actually inspired by um invasion of the body snatchers at short and then so what i did was i kind of just like put up you know like sound actors from like all across the u.s so there's actually actors from you know like cal like los angeles area like new york area like florida i think we got the people from like atlanta area so it's like, so it's all over. And then we had them just like shoot short, a bunch of shorts or like little skits on their, um, their phones and then send it to them, send it to me and then went through all this stuff and like, you know, kind of give them like an outline of like what we wanted and like, here's an example and let them just add their own like creative spin on it. Yeah. And then I did all like, you know, like added the sound effects to kind of make it more a coherent piece and um, and then also like for the news anchors and like the podcaster, 
we found people that had like green screens and could shoot it themselves and send me the footage. Some of the footage was like really rough, so that's why like the newscasters had to like do some tricks to make it look like older and stuff to just, like, the quality definitely did not match up. So I think someone even sent me like a, one of the news anchors, they're just standing in front of like a tan sheet, so I had to like cut them out frame by frame. So that one was like a really, it was a lot of work to get that one to where it's at. But I think it, it paid off. Oh, and it's funny, um, actually too, with the social distancing and do you remember the part where the main character looks out his window? Yeah, yeah, and he sees like the yeah. neighbors. Yeah, they're all they're, they're all actually his neighbors. They're all six feet apart. <laughs> yeah, they're all like six feet apart. So yeah, I you know what? Now I have a whole new perspective on that. Yes, I I clearly remember that. I mean, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's great. Talk about uh, you know being able to use what um, what you've been given. I mean, that's awesome. Alex showcases his films on his YouTube channel, and he explained to me how he tries to pace his films for that streaming service. Uh, well, with some of these, I guess with Outbreak, because it's like a slower start, and so that one I feel like hasn't done as well. Um, and then they say, like I've heard like multiple times, like on YouTube, you only have like three seconds, or like seven, like three to seven seconds to like catch someone's attention. Yeah. So it's, so it's like a lot of the times, you know, if there's nothing really like in the beginning, I try to like start it when like something that's going to hook you like from the beginning, because it's like you're, you're with a lot of these shorts, you know, it's like I'm not a no name. So it's me trying to hook new people like as quick as I can. So they'll actually sit there and watch it. Like I don't have like that luxury of building it for, you know, a minute or two before anything happens. I gotta grab them and, and um, it's kind of like, I guess just like grab people and like hold their attention as much as long as I can to kind of like get them to watch this short and like give it a chance. And so that's kind of what I've been, I try to do with that one, that one especially, and that one's like actually has like a really high view through rate. I think the woman in white might be like the highest because it's kind of just like grabs you in like all action. Aria Jackson is the writer-director of the horror short Phone Home, which won Best Supernatural Film and Best Original Story at the 2020 Hollywood Horror Fest. When she joined me on the program, I asked her where she came up with the concept for the film. So it came up in like two parts over the course of probably a couple months. I think I was hanging out with some of my friends. And then they had this really, and they had the phone. So they, they own this antique phone, which is the prop that we ended up using. And I was just like, we should make a movie. And they were like, yeah. And then I just looked over at the phone and I was like, well, as if it's like a horror movie about a phone. And they were just like, okay. And then like, that was the end of the conversation, but I still had that phone in my head. And then months later, um, I was just thinking of this really creepy shot and that shot is what I used for the ending. So I had this really creepy scene in mind and I was like, well, that's a really cool scene. And then I was like, well, what about that phone? And I was like, well, what about this scene? And then like, I think a month later, um, I was like, wait, I can put them together. And I just ended up writing it over the course of like a month. And then after I finished writing it, we went into production like a week later. Sometimes unexpected things can happen when making a film, especially an independent film. Aria's actress, who played Brie, the co-lead in the film, left the production to go to the Cannes Film Festival. Obviously, this left the production with a pretty major issue on their hands. However, there was a silver lining with that departure. See, a couple days before our final filming day, she messaged me and she was just like, I'm going to France. And I was like, what? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I was just like, oh, okay. I was like, that's fine. Because I, I can't hold that against her. I'm not going to be like, wow, she went to Cannes instead of the set. So I just, I think three days before our final filming day, uh, she dropped out. And then I was just like, oh my God. And then the makeup artist, Alethea Spencer, worked with Gabriella on another feature, Blood from Stone, which was a, which is like a zombie vampire movie. Mm -hmm. So Gabby was the lead in that. And then Alethea was like, Gabby can do it. And I was like, please, yes, Gabby, just come to set. So that was, a couple of days before our final filming day. So Gabby came in and then we just knocked out all the scenes. So we had to reshoot some of the scenes because we had already shot some scenes with the original actress. So our final day, uh, we reshot everything I... with Gabby. We redid all the voice lines with Gabby. And 
that was it. I was like, wow. dude, you're awesome. Thank you. And then that was her first day, like meeting everybody on set. So like, she's just new to like the whole crew and she had to be like naked in a tub and like, we had to like cover her in blood. And she was such a trooper. She was really, and the whole time she was like, yeah, cool. Awesome. And I was like, you're a lifesaver. She like saved my life. I'm someone who can overthink things sometimes. Well, actually, a lot of the times. And um, that can also happen when making a movie. Uh, Aria explained how that almost happened when they were recording the phone call sequences with her co-stars, Travis and Gabby. Uh, from what I remember, we recorded her lines on the phone completely separately. So we just had Travis talking to okay. himself, and then Gabby would be talking off camera, but it wasn't recorded. And then we just had her... Uh, say it later gotcha and i think the only reason we did it like that is because gabby came late it it was a little confusing him and i did have some talks on how because at one point him and i were thinking way too big we were like well why if we give travis an earpiece and then we have the actress in another room of the house and they're talking over the earpiece and we were like that that way doesn't make sense (laughs) we're making this way like we were gonna make it really complicated we were like why if we get a real phone and then we were like okay (laughs) we just gotta just record the audio just (laughs) separately i don't know what we're doing Oh, that's great. Yeah, no, I've been there. The overcomplication is my middle name. <laughs> yeah, so we so were, I, we I were feel about there. to make it. We were about to make it really hard. We were like, well, what if we get like a Bluetooth earpiece, yeah. and then we have Gabby outside, and it's like, why are we doing exactly? Why? It's no like reason. it's it's taken us a week to do this. <laughs> All we yeah, had to so do we was were, have rough we camera. Like, we were like, is it going to make it more authentic? And we were like, no, it's just going to make it harder. It's <laughs> not something we should be doing. It's like we don't but have the time. Like, <laughs> yeah, I think that was the most complicated part because him and I had never uh, done it like phone conversations to that extent. Like if you do it like as a pickup or like one scene, but like a whole film based off of like phone conversations, that's what him and I were most nervous about was would it feel natural. And I think it ended up uh, feeling pretty good. The ending the phone home is a very slow and extended final shot. Arya was told that that actually wasn't very scary, but she stuck with her guns and decided to use that as her ending. I think this might be my favorite quote of the year because it shows you that when you believe in something and when you fight for it, you'll get the results you expected the whole time. This ending is an effective ending that sticks with you so much so that you'll be watching it over and over again. When I was explaining what I wanted at the end, like even with people that were reading the script i'd make it clear i'd be like this shot i was like it doesn't cut away it's just a long take and then super slow and then people would be like okay like nobody really understood what i wanted i'd be like i'd be like it's just a wide shot and then it just doesn't cut away and they're just like i think somebody told me that wasn't scary somebody really was fighting me on that they were like no and it needs to be like a close-up like you need to do a couple different angles and i was like no i was like we're not cutting away um but I think it was just going to be the most visceral part of it and really scary. And I did want it to have, I did want phone home to have no jump scares, except I guess, I don't know if the title card counts as one, but yeah, I wanted that to be very slow and very intense. If anything, Travis, because Travis played the part of the end too with the, Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's okay. also him. Okay. I'd always be like, we did a couple takes and I'd be like, Travis, slower and he'd be like oh man how slow does she want this and i'd be like slow and i think we probably slowed it down too but i wanted it to go on for a very long time and make everybody really uncomfortable and i love the end i, I like, do the too whole project i like but then i watch the whole ending and i'm just like yes that's why because that's what i wanted like i only wrote phone home just for the ending on that note i think that is an appropriate spot to conclude my look back at 2020 But wait, I'm not done. This year was just crazy and depressing, and I thought I'd end the show with some silliness and stupidity from yours truly. Uh, Now, as much as I'd like to think I'm absolutely perfect every time I record myself doing my raps, that's, um, well, that's sadly not the case. Sometimes I go off the rails. So uh, I thought I'd share some of those outtakes with you from 2020, as well as 2019. Cue the silly music. And welcome to another edition of the Graveyard Show podcast, the Tombstone Edition. I am your caretaker and the carrier. (sighs) 
me very stupid. And they'll give you their score, two out of four stars, three out of five, five out of five, whatever. But a... <laughs> Scare the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> now that was funny. Uh, playback of the other show started in my ear. Kaboom. What the hell? These voices. <laughs> uh, okay. All right, let me see where I left off. Takes a movie like Dawn of the Dead or, you know, some other movies out there like uh, The Godfather. Really? Do you really have to do this right now? All right, go in the other room. Go ahead. Go ahead. The sad walk of a dog. One that's bored. <laughs> She's had enough of me. All right. She done? I think she's in bed. All right. She's on the bed. She's resting. She's, she's comfortable. All right. As long as she's happy, we're all happy. All right. where we will be revisiting my interview with director Kevin Greidert. The time? I have no idea, because I don't have it in front of me. Let's take a look, since that would be important, since that's part of the, part of my thing that I do, man. Uh, you were late. You were, you were late. Oh, no. Uh, let me see. Yes. The time? <laughs> All right. And you are listening to the Graveyard Show podcast, and I am your caretaker, and the graveyard is open. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back inside the graveyard. It's great having all of you here. It is still too hot on this microphone. I need to do something about this. So stand by while I figure out how to actually mix. Cause I'm not a mixer, am I? Or am I? Eh, not really. I mean, I pretend I am, but I'm really not. My newest tombstone has the name of Jason Hignite on it. The man that you heard at the top of the show. He was the events coordinator. Oh, that's awesome. I love having my phone going off during the middle of my open. That is just so awesome. I, I'm an idiot. And uh, for the record, the only cursing done on the show this year was uh, what you just heard from me of all people. So there you go. I broke my own rule. Um, I do have to say that uh, resuming interviews on the program this year, uh, it really did exceed anything I thought uh, it ever would be. Um, so having said that, um, I would be a real fool if I did not send out a bunch of thank yous. So here we go. First of all, I have to thank all of my guests for appearing on the show this year. Jay Cheel, Marjorie DeHay, Paul Overacker, Alex Magania, Arya Jackson, Jeremy King, Zoe Graham, and David Weiner. All of you, and I mean all of you, made my return to interviewing a real blast. It was a pleasure, and I, I really do look forward to speaking with all of you again on the show uh, somewhere down the road. Um, I have to thank the ladies over at Katrina Juan PR for uh, all of their assistance this year. And um, I do look forward to working with them again next year and beyond. Of course, I have to thank all of you out there listening to the show here in the United States as well as around the world. I, I know that there are a lot of podcasting choices out there, especially nowadays. So thank you for choosing uh, to listen to the Graveyard Show podcast. Uh, I really do try every show to give you something worthy of your time, something that's fun, educational, informative, um, and, uh, and something you enjoy listening to um, on a uh, bi-weekly or uh, you know, monthly basis. So uh, looking at the numbers, there are more and more of you out there finding the program. So thank you so much. And I really do look forward to seeing all of you here again in 2021. Lastly, but always first in my heart, uh, I have to thank my wife, Mrs. Caretaker, for all of her love and support. Uh, honey, I love you, and I certainly could not do this show without you. And I thank you for putting up with my insanity <laughs> when I'm doing these shows. <laughs>
And as I begin to close down the graveyard, um, I want to remind all of you again that my final podcast of the year will be uh, the re-airing of the uh, Graveyard Show podcast number one, the original, the very first one from January 1st, 2009. And it features my interview with uh, Jack Messett, who is the co-writer and the director of the film Midnight Movie. And if you haven't seen it, you can catch it on Amazon. Uh, Midnight Movie, the killer cut is available on Prime for you to watch. The Graveyard Show podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and everywhere podcasts exist. The show is also available on YouTube. Just search for Graveyard Show Podcast. Starting in 2021, I will be publishing original and exclusive content for my YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe to the channel so you get those updates. If you know anyone who's a fan of horror, please invite them to enter the graveyard. New listeners and friends are always welcome. Enjoy the holidays, my friends. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane. Enjoy the moments with your family and friends. I think, if anything, this year has shown us how truly important that is in our lives. And as you exit the graveyard, I would like to remind you to please lock the gate behind you. We wouldn't want anyone to get out. Until next time.